To be proficient with network protocols, we need to understand the basics. We need to know how to send packets from point A to point B. What is going to be in between? In this video, I will go from zero explaining how the routing process works. Then we'll get into dynamic routing protocols and particularly we'll be talking about OFPF, the most common routing protocol implemented in the company's networks. Welcome to the network trip. To be able to build a strong knowledge it is vital to understand how routing and networks work. In this video, I will go from zero, talking about the routing process, different mechanisms to exchange routes to remote networks, and then we'll talk about different types of dynamic routing protocols. A router is a network device that moves packets from one network to a different network. For example, in this diagram, we have multiple networks located in different sites. We can identify three routers in that topology. We have one router on the left, one router on the top, and one router on the right. Every router has networks that are directly connected. There are two networks that are directly connected to R1. In this case, network A that is connected out of that interface and network B that is connected out of that interface. We can notice something interesting here and it's that guy there. That is just a switch. A switch in this case is a layer 2 device. It's just extending a broadcast domain. In that way, we can get several interfaces to connect a large number of devices. By default, all the networks that are directly connected to a router will have IP connectivity. For example, if I have a router and I'm connecting one device on Ether1 and I'm connecting a second device on Ether2 and every interface has its own network configure such as for example 192, 168, 00 slash 24 and the second interface is using the network 10, 0, 0, 0 slash 24 by default this router is gonna see those networks as connected networks and the routes will be dynamically created what is the routing function that this device is gonna be performing Let's assume that PC1 has the IP 192.168.0.10 and PC2 has the IP 10.0.0.10. So what is going to happen is that this PC at the layer number 3, that is the IP layer, is going to create a packet and it's going to add the source and destination IP address. So it's going to be something like that. So the source IP is going to be 192.168.0.10 and the destination IP is going to be 10.0.0.10 The operating system in PC1 is going to go through the ANDing process so we are not going to go deeper with that we'll talk about the ANDing process in a different video in the channel but at the end PC1 is going to determine that the destination IP is in a different network so basically PC1 is going to forward that packet to the router. Then the router is going to take that packet and is going to verify the destination IP address. Routers are going to take the decision based on the destination IP address. And then we'll take the destination IP address and it's going to go to the routing table. So inside that device, there is a routing table that basically has some entries that were generated just by adding those IPs to the Ether1 and Ether2 interfaces. So this is going to be something like this. 192.168.00-16 that is reachable out the interface Ether1 and 10.0.0.24 that is reachable out of the interface Ether2. So the router, after 
taking that packet is going to extract the destination IP address and it's going to perform a process that is called the next hop lookup that basically has as a goal to find where to send that packet, where to forward that packet. Then it's going to check those entries and it's going to find that entry over there. The network 10.0.0.0 slash 24 has the IP 10.0.0.10 inside the range. So that means that the router is going to forward that packet out of Ether2. So you can see at this point, the process that we have performed is just configuring the IP addresses in those interfaces. We are not using a static route. We are not using dynamic routing because if the networks are directly connected, those entries there will be added dynamically by the router. So this is the first scenario. So we have in this diagram, those routers with some networks directly connected. But what is going to happen if one device inside the network A needs to establish network connectivity with one device on network C or network D? If this computer is sending a packet that is going to one device on the network C, so let's assume that this IP is C, R1 is going to check the routing table and it's going to say, uh-uh, I have a problem. I'm getting a packet that is going to the IP C, but my routing table has only two entries. One that is pointing to network A and the other one pointing to network B. There is no way for that device to get information about remote networks or non-connected networks without performing some sort of configuration. So how is that guy there going to know? where to send the packets that are going to one device inside the network C or one device inside the network D. And here is where the magic of the routing process comes to the game. There is a special name for that process. And you will see that as the learning process, learning routes. So we have one router is not aware about remote networks. So we need to configure. We need to go through that uh, learning process of how that device is going to learn about external networks. And basically there are just two ways. The first one is going to the router and telling the router explicitly, if you want to go to C, you are going to send the packets in this way. For example, if this is the network A and here on the right, we have the network B we are managing that router R1. So we need to go to R1 and we are going to say, if you need to send packets to devices on the network B, then you will send the packets in that way. And we'll use the IP that is configured on the RS2 interface that is facing our router. So that means that now if that device here on network A is sending a packet to one device on the network B, the router is going to use that entry and will forward that packet to R2. But now the problem is on R2. R2 is going to get that packet, it's going to check that the destination IP is not in its routing table. And then it's going to say, I have a problem. I don't have a route pointing to network B. So basically, if we don't have routes, R2 is just going to drop the packet. And it's going to send an ICMP message telling the source, destination, network, unreachable. So that means that if we are using the static approach, we'll need to go to every router in our topology and we need to add information about the remote networks. So you can see that if we have a large number of routers, we'll have a lot of problems. Additionally, we are not going to have redundancy. What happens, for example, if we are telling R1 that all the traffic going to the network B will be sent to R2, but uh, that link is going down, or maybe that link is going down. So now we need to send the traffic in the other direction, to R3. That is not going to happen aromatically when using ecstatic routes. 
we can really mess up our topology. Then we have the second way for learning routes, and that is dynamic routing protocols. So in this way, we are just going to configure a dynamic routing protocol in those devices. They will be talking the same language. For example, if this device is using OSPF and that device is using OSPF, they will talk to each other. Every protocol is going to have a function, is going to have rules, and it's going to have a format. So in this case, if they are configured by using OSPF, they have the function. The function is basically exchanging routes. Rules. There are some rules that we need to follow when implementing, when configuring OSPF. In that way, those routers will talk to each other successfully. Those devices will be exchanging different types of messages and those messages will follow a strict format. The dynamic routing protocols will perform several operations to find the best loop-free path based on the destination network. We can have a pretty complex topology, but the dynamic routing protocol is going to figure out how to reach the destination without generating routing loops. But uh, what options do we have out there? First of all, we need to understand that there are two big categories when talking about dynamic routing protocols, and those are IGP and EGP. IGP stands for Interior Gateway Protocol, and EGP stands for Exterior Gateway Protocol. So what's the main difference here? Let's assume that you work for a service provider, a medium or large organization, such as a university, a retail store, or something similar. Then that is going to be your network, your company's network. So that is going to be what is called autonomous system, your network. So inside your network, you are going to use an IGP internal gateway protocol. For example, you can pick OSPF. Probably there is a second company, a different organization, a different service provider is going to have its own autonomous system. And this company is also going to be running inside his network an IGP. So it can be, for example, ISIS. That is not supported in my at this point. But there are several IGPs available, and we can use those IGPs inside our networks, inside our autonomous system. So those are IGPs. But what happens if we are routing on internet, for example? So the ISP one needs to talk to the ISP two. Similar to those two ISPs, there are millions of networks that need to be advertised on the internet. We have thousands of autonomous systems exchanging routing information on the internet. So in that case, we're going to use an EGP. There is just one option here, and that is called the Border Gateway Protocol, BGP. Once we have understood the categories that we have for dynamic routing protocols, then we can get focus on IGPs. There are three types of IGPs. The first one is distance vector. One protocol in this category is RIP, Routing Information Protocol. A distance vector protocol is going to look for the best path based on the number of hops. For example, if I have a topology similar to the one in the whiteboard now, so RIP is going to get information from its neighbors and it's going to say, okay, if I go in this way, I will go through one and two routers. So the path number one is going to have a hop count of two. If I go in this way, that is going to have three as the hop count. And now RIP is going to say, OK, I'm a distance vector protocol. So the best path from my perspective is the path with less 
hops. So in that way, we're gonna say, okay, my best path is gonna go over there. R1, R2, and R5. An issue that we can have when using a distance vector protocol is that we are ignoring some properties such as the speed on the links, for example. Let's assume that in this topology, the links above are 100 megabits per second each. And then the links down are offering one gigabit per second. So from the perspective of RIP, the best path is going through R2 and then R5. But we are wasting the bandwidth that we have at the bottom. And that is a better speed, so we'll be able to send more data out of those interfaces. And here is where it comes, the second type of dynamic routing protocols, link state. And here we have OFPF and we have ISIS. By far, the most common dynamic routing protocol is OFPF. If you are working with an IGP, most likely you will be dealing with OFPF. Obviously, in some cases, you will find a different IGP. ISIS is kind of similar to OFPF, but it's not supported on microtic devices. In one of the upcoming playlists here in the channel, we'll go over the Cisco routing protocol for service providers, and then we'll cover ISIS. That is not supported in router OS at this point. The link state protocol have a cost associated to its interfaces. And now instead of looking for the best path based on the number of hops, OFPF is going to look for the best path based on a metric that is called the cost. And we can assign the cost to those interfaces. By default, in router OS, that cost is 10. So, for example, we can say the cost for going in that way is going to be 10 and 10. And then we can manipulate the cost in the path that is at the bottom. And now, this path is going to have a cost of 3. And that path is going to have a cost of 20. So, the best path is the one with the lower cost. Now R1 is going to send the traffic to R3, then to R4, R5, and finally it's going to reach the destination. And that is the magic with link state protocols. There is another category here that is hybrid, and there is a protocol that is called EIGRP that is supported only on Cisco devices, even though that now is open to every vendor so at this point only Cisco devices are supporting EIGRP. And then for the external gateway protocols, we have BGP, that is called a path vector protocol. BGP is going to have a list of attributes. And instead of looking for the best path based in just a single property, it's gonna have a list of properties. And then we'll start from top to bottom looking for the best path. So we'll have a full section for BGP here in the okay. channel. So now we'll get focus in OFPF. This is an open protocol. There is an RFC 2328 that is setting the basics, all the specifications for implementing OFPF. If you want to go deeper with all the technical stuff related to OFPF, then we can take as a reference that document. And here I have the official document, RFC 2328, that is setting the specification for OFPF version 2. More than 200 pages, but basically all the network vendors that have OFPF implemented are going to take this document as the base. There are some enhancements, some improvements that have been performed over the time on OFPF, and that's why we can see here at the top some updates. But this document is the base. For example, if uh, there is a specific uh, type of authentication that is going to be supported in OFPF, such as, for example, HMAC, then there is a RFC that is going to define the specification for that update. But still, this is going to be the base file. For example, if I go to any of those documents, we'll see just a specific set of configurations. OFPF v2, HMAC, 
SHA, for example, cryptographic authentication, then here, multi-instance extensions, and so on and so forth. OSPF has its own IP protocol, and that is the IP protocol 89. For example, if I'm adding a rule in my firewall to allow all the OSPF messages, then I can, for example, look for the protocol, and here we can find OSPF. That is the protocol 89, or simply we can type 89, and RouterOS knows that this is the OSPF protocol. And now we can apply conditions and we can accept that traffic, for example. OSPF supports VLSM, the variable length thumbnail mask. Basically, that means that we can work with different sizes, with different prefix length, and we are not going to have any issues. Additionally, OSPF supports summarization and authentication. There are two types of authentication, clear text and MD5. Those two types are supported by all the network vendors, so we won't have any issues managing those two types of authentication. There are two OSPF versions. V2 is for IPv4 and V3 is for IPv6. So we can have a pretty complex topology. We'll configure OSPF inside every router in that topology. But how is internally the device going to calculate the best path to reach a particular destination? OSPF is going to use an algorithm that is called the Dijkstra algorithm. So basically, this is a mathematical process that is going to be performed by the router. Good news is that you don't need to understand how the Dijkstra algorithm is going to work because that can get pretty complex, but that is already there, is inside RouterOS. We don't need to understand exactly how the Dijkstra algorithm is going to find the best path. But the simple thing that matters here is that this Dijkstra algorithm is going to have a source and is going to build a tree with the best path to reach every node in this topology. And the best path is going to be based on the cost. For example, if we are going from A to E, which are the options? One option is going from A to B, then we can go directly to E, for example. So we have A, B, E, and the cost for that is going to be 16. We can go in this way, and that cost is going to be 13. Additionally, we can go in that way, and that cost is going to be 12. We can go in that way, but we'll have a pretty high cost. So you can see that the Dijkstra algorithm is going to scan the network, the different path, and then it's going to find the best path to reach a destination. So if we have those three paths, then the Dijkstra algorithm is going to say that's the best path for going from A to E. And now the OSPF process running inside every router is going to have information about the best path for reaching a remote network. Cost is the critical element that we need to be aware of when working with OSPF. If we have multiple paths for reaching a destination, we can manipulate the behavior, the path to pick, by changing, by modifying the cost value. By default, router OS 7 is going to have a cost of one in every interface router s6 had a cost of 10 so we need to be aware of that change so by default we are just adding the interfaces to the ofpf process every interface is going to have a cost of one so we need to manipulate that then we can start changing the values i hope this video has been helpful for you we briefly talk about ofpf in the upcoming video we'll go deeper will create a pretty basic topology with OSPF, but that is going to be the base for analyzing all the messages that are going from one device to the other. We'll talk about the hello packets and all the different OSPF message types. I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you.